So I want to get right into it. And my first question, sir, is a lot of people are talking about freedom of speech and freedom of, of thought and how it's under assault. How do you view, how is freedom of expression, freedom of thought and speech faring in 2023? Well, depends where we're talking about. Take the United States, what we're primarily interested in. Mm. Uh, there are a couple dozen states, I think about 30, that have legislation to prevent the teaching of American history legislation. They don't put it that way, but that's what it amounts to. Uh, what the way it's put, this went all the way up to the White House under Trump, is you can't teach anything divisive or anything that makes certain students uncomfortable, where certain students means privileged white students. Hmm. can't teach anything that makes them uncomfortable. Well, history happens to have those effects in every country, certainly here. Teach the history, it's going to make people feel uncomfortable. It's not what they like to believe about uh, the patriotic slogans. So what it says is, can't teach history. Uh, is that a restriction on freedom of thought and expression? Pretty severe. It's the kind you find in totalitarian states. Uh, the most extreme example is Florida, governed by the man who may be the next president, Ron DeSantis, somewhere to the right of Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, he, his policies are quite open and frank, not hidden, direct threats to universities, uh, teaching content, has to be censored by the state authorities. Uh, tenure is under attack so that uh, uh, teachers don't have freedom to express what they want. There are open, public, not secret, in fact, heralded efforts to take over colleges that have a reputation for liberal, being liberal and open, <clears throat> and to turn them onto extreme right institutions. Uh, that's Florida, uh, all over the country, there's a mobilization by Republicans of uh, right-wing parents. They're called moms to make it feel friendly and nice. Uh, mm. Remove books from libraries, take over school boards, uh, harass and threaten teachers. Schools are supposed to impose narrowly patriotic Christian nationalist orthodoxy uh, all of this in the name of history. Well, is this a threat to freedom of thought and expression? I think so. Far outweighs those that are being discussed. Far outweighs them. Why do you think Americans in particular are so sensitive about learning an actual and true history in a way that, say, Germans have come to terms with or are beginning to come to terms or in the process of coming to terms with their history. But in America, there's a real sensitivity to the violence of American history. Why Germany. is that? Germany is not a good example. Germany was defeated in a war. Mm. If you're defeated in a war, you have to come to terms with what you did. Okay, Japan looked into its atrocities. The U.S. is victorious in all wars, always. There are things that are called failures, but they're not. So, of course, you never look into anything. So you want to model, take, say, England. Uh, England has a horrendous, shocking record of hundreds of years of massive atrocities. It's never been looked at. Just now, the last couple of years, for the first time after centuries of praising the angelic character of England, the British are beginning to look into their horrendous record. Partly it has to do with British decline. They're no longer ruling the waves. So uh, do you wanna know why the United States doesn't look into its own history? Because it's victorious. Uh, who has to look at anything? Take, we're right now coming up to the 50th anniversary of the war in uh, Vietnam, the worst atrocity, worst crime in the post Second World War period. We're coming up to the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, 
supreme international crime for the kind for which Nazis were hanged at Nuremberg. Just listen to the rhetoric that's going to come out about these anniversaries. After 50 years, the most that can be said about Vietnam in any in mainstream circles is a, was a mistake. A mistake. Benign intentions went awry. Was it? Uh, ask the victims of uh, uh, B-52 raids in heavily settled areas whether it was a mistake. No, it's not our topic. What about Iraq? Uh, I mean, the suppression is so extreme that Harvard University is now being lauded because they were open enough to sponsor a debate on whether the US, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, special military operation in Iraq was a humanitarian intervention. I suppose this was going on in Moscow University about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We'd collapse in ridicule, but here we praise it. Well, if you're victorious all the time, you don't face your own uh, crimes. So let's not teach history. Why should we make uh, uh, white privileged children feel that there's something unpleasant in the history? Do you think America was not defeated in Iraq or Afghanistan? I think an argument could be made that, that the United States was defeated in Afghanistan in particular. Really? But, but well, I mean, I think those images from August from Kabul in 2021 were pretty, pretty well, shameful and shocking. What we call defeated is not achieving our maximal aims. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't turn Afghanistan into uh, some colony. Okay. How were we defeated? It's the Afghans who were defeated. The US invasion of Afghanistan had no justification whatsoever, none. Uh, the US suspected suspected that bin Laden and al-Qaeda were responsible for 9-11. They didn't know it. In fact, eight months after the invasion, the head of the FBI, Robert Mueller, gave his first major press conference. He said, we suspect that al-Qaeda was responsible for 9-11, but after the most intensive uh, investigation in history, we haven't proved it. That's eight months after the invasion, uh, the Taliban offered to surrender right away, well, within a couple of weeks. Uh, the US government, uh, Donald Rumsfeld said, we do not negotiate surrenders. Sure, the president, George Bush, backed him up. We're going to say, what do they invade for? Well, the best reason was given, that I know, was given by, uh, the most respected leader of the anti-Taliban Afghan resistance, Abdul Haq, gave an interview right after the invasion. He, like other anti-Taliban Afghan resistors, was strongly opposed to the invasion. He said the United States just wants to bomb freely, kill Afghans. They'll undermine our efforts to overthrow uh, the Taliban from within, but they don't care. They just want to show their muscle and intimidate everyone. Can you think of a better explanation? Well, that's what they did. They showed their muscle, they intimidated everyone. Afghanistan was uh, 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 subjected to 20 years of uh, night raids by special forces, uh, drone attacks, uh, uh, killing people in wedding uh, um, um, uh, uh, parties, uh, uh, the rural society devastated, then uh, the United States pulled out. That's a defeat. That's what we call a defeat. It's like what the British called a defeat if they didn't achieve their maximal objectives. Do you see America retrenching or withdrawing from the world or today after 20 years of war, or is it merely recalibrating to have a long-term conflict with China? 
take a look at this morning's newspaper. It's a good place to start, New York Times. There's an article celebrating the fact that Japan is now joining the United States in its massive effort to uh, what they call uh, encircle China, it's the official word. Uh, Japan is uh, sharply increasing its military forces. Uh, the Marines in Okinawa and elsewhere are being uh, given beefed up uh, military capacities to complete the encirclement of China. My, not my term, that's the official term. Encirclement of China means surrounding China with a ring of what are called sentinel states armed with uh, precision weapons aimed at China, backed by enormous naval maneuvers in the Pacific, the RIMPAC maneuvers. All of this is to counter Chinese aggressiveness. Uh, where is the Chinese aggressiveness? Is it in the Caribbean? Is it off the coast of the Pacific? Chinese aggressiveness is the fact that what they're doing in the South China Sea which can be criticized, uh, though it's not doesn't even come anywhere near what the United States does all over the world. Uh, this is now celebrated. Uh, we're going to be prepared to uh, uh, have a stronger response if China invades Taiwan. Is there any indication that China is going to invade Taiwan outside the American press and the State Department? Well, tell me about it. Uh, what China has said is, their official position at least, is to maintain the situation and ultimately there will be a peaceful reunification. Uh, actually, the United States is still officially bound by the, uh, what's called the One China policy. The United States recognizes that China, that Taiwan is part of China, but both sides agree on what's called strategic ambiguity, not to um, carry out provocative actions off the coast of China, not off the coast of the United States, okay? Uh, well, recently the United States has been carrying out quite provocative acts, uh, can run through them. In fact, uh, not just Taiwan, a couple of months ago, uh, President Biden basically declared war against China. It's the way it's described in the International Financial Trust. The goal is to ensure that China cannot carry out technological development for the next couple of decades. Uh, the United States intends to use its substantial control over supply chains and other countries like the Netherlands and South Korea to prevent any use by China of any technology that has any, comes from any source in the United States, semiconductors, chips, and so on. Well, the way the international system is designed, that includes just about everything. Almost everything is going to involve some patent in the United States. So it's essentially a declaration of war says we will stop your technological development, but we have to counter the threat of China. I mean. I think we would both agree that China is not a free society and what they've done in terms of, you know, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, their attitudes in the region. It seems like this is not just simply a case of American imperialism, but there actually is a competition between two states with two very different political and economic models. Is that fair? China internally is very repressive. That is of zero concern to the United States. The United States strongly supports states which are violent and repressive. There's hardly a more repressive state in the world than Saudi Arabia. Uh, what Israel is doing in Gaza is easily compares with what China's uh, doing in Zhenjiang province. There are leading military, the leading recipient of US military aid. I mean, all of this is sheer propaganda. 
Yes, China's very ugly internal policies. It's of no concern to anyone, zero. Uh, what's of concern to American planners, writers in the New York Times, is that China doesn't follow orders. Actually, there was an interesting article about this in Australia, which is right in the jaws of the dragon. The former prime minister, Paul Keating, noting, noted uh, Asia specialist diplomat, had an article on the China thread. And he ran through the various threats and pointed out that they're not threats. Maybe they're ugly, but they're not threats to anyone. And he concluded that the China threat is China exists. That's correct. China's not like Europe. When the United States snaps its finger, Europe falls into line. The United States says, we're going to impose harsh sanctions on Iran to punish Iran for the fact that we, we, not they, destroyed the, the uh, nuclear agreement, but we have to punish them for our destroying it. Europe says we don't want to go along, we don't agree, but then they agree. China doesn't, they just go their own way. Yes, that's a threat. How likely do you see a major military conflict between the United States and China in the near future? We can safely say there will never be a conflict, very safe. The reason if, if we're wrong, there won't be anybody around to say, tell us. Yeah. Continuing on our discussion about American foreign policy, I want to ask you about Israel in particular. A new right-wing, extreme right-wing government elected in Israel. Should Is the hope for a Palestinian state lost forever? And if not, how does the Palestinian issue now in the future get resolved when the government says there are no such thing as Palestinians and recently just banned the flying of the Palestinian flag? Well, it's much worse than that. They're stepping up there. Uh, Israel's carrying out very brutal, violent activities almost daily. You read the few uh, honest journalists, uh, Gideon Levy, uh, Amir Haas, others who cover the West Bank, hardly a day goes by without some terrorist attack against Palestinians, either by right-wing settlers or by the Israeli army or by both of them together. Uh, right now they're evacuating thousands of people from villages in Masaf Ariyata, not a day goes by. Gaza, of course, is much worse. In Gaza, there's uh, two million people in basically a concentration camp. Uh, there's a million children who can't get access to water because uh, Israel's destroyed the power stations, the um, sewage stations, and so on. I mean, do we care? You know, we care. Pour money in to support them. Okay, that's uh, U.S. policy. Now, it could be changing. The current government is so far to the right that American liberals are having a hard time giving support to Israel. In fact, support to Israel in the United States over the past 10 or 20 years has shifted. Support used to be liberal Democrats, a bastion of democracy in the Middle East. It was a farce, but that's what was believed. It was very hard to accept now. I mean, even uh, people, the most loyal uh, defenders of Israeli crimes like Alan Dershowitz, already uttering heaps of protest. A support for Israel has shifted to the far right in the United States. Christian evangelicals, uh, ultranationalists, security forces, tightly linked to Israel. Well, that could lead to changes in US policy. In fact, there are signs of it. Uh, last year, uh, one Congresswoman Betsy McCollum actually proposed that U.S. law be followed. U.S. law, so-called lay law, bans military aid to any military units 
that are involved in systematic human rights violations. That's the whole IDF. Uh, she got 17 representatives in Congress to support her. It was followed by a letter, a right-wing Republican put together a group uh, saying nothing should ever interfere in any way with our support for Israel. He got 300 signatures. So it's 17 against 300, but that's a victory. 17 is amazing. A couple of years ago, you wouldn't have gone to one because nobody's allowed to break ranks on this. You have to worship the holy state. Okay, it's changing. Could change more. Maybe more con people in Congress will say we ought to apply our own laws with regard to Israel. That could lead to a change. There are other things that could lead to a change. Uh, let's take uh, Iran against. Uh, Iran is regarded almost uniformly across the spectrum as one of the greatest threats to world peace. Well, Iran has a rotten government, but just how is it a threat to world peace? Uh, think about it. Iran's a threat to world peace. Well, what's said is the Iran nuclear programs could be a threat. Is there a way to deal with Iran's nuclear programs? Simple. Uh, impose a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East, takes care of Iran's nuclear programs. Any difficulty with this? Supported by all the Arab states, strongly supported. Supported by Iran, again, strongly supported. The whole global south, totally in support. Now, they're not considered here, they're not real people, wrong color of skin, but uh, Europe no objections. So why don't we do it? Because the United States vetoes it. Obama vetoed it. Everybody knows why. It would mean that Israeli nuclear facilities would have to be placed under inspection. The United States does not even recognize that Israel has nuclear weapons. Of course, everybody knows they do. Why don't they recognize it? Because if they do, American law might come into operation. Symington Amendment, other laws, which raise the question whether US aid to Israel is legal under US law. Nobody wants to raise that question. So we are not allowed to discuss, even to discuss the obvious ways to end what's considered one of the greatest threats to world peace. You want to talk about propaganda? That's pretty impressive. Here's a simple way to end what's called one of the greatest threats to world peace. Not only can't we implement it, we can't talk about it. That's rigid doctrinal control, very tight, way beyond the kinds of things you were talking about in your questions never discussed. We can discuss it. If suppose we do discuss it, suppose American people recognize that we're facing a major threat to world peace, maybe a war in the Middle East, because we have to protect uh, Israeli nuclear weapons from discussion. I think even right-wing Americans would be appalled by this. So if we started to talk about it, you might get a big change in American public opinion. One of the reasons why you don't talk about it if you're well-behaved, uh, uh, obedient to the doctrinal system, you just don't talk about it, but you can. And if you do, could be more changes in American policy. Well, suppose there are changes. Uh, Israel may made a, Fateful decision in the 1970s, very fateful decision. It had the opportunity for a peaceful settlement with, with the Arab states and the Palestinians. Uh, there were security, UN security, um, um, security Council um, uh, debated resolutions, which called for a political settlement on the 
official border uh, with guarantees for the rights of each state, including Israel, to exist in peace and security with insecure and recognized borders. That's the wording. U.S. vetoed it, okay? Continued like that. Israel, of course, strongly opposed it, strongly opposed any agreement that had offered anything to Palestinians. That's the Labour Party, incidentally, not the right wing, the so-called left, Yitzhak Rabin, Golda Meir, and so on. Well, they had that opportunity in 1970s. Israel decided not to seek peace, which was straightforward, but to expand. Expansion was adopted in favor of security. That meant total reliance on the United States. And that means that when the United States gives orders, they don't have much choice. So if American, Paul, and over and over, uh, in fact, every American president prior to Obama uh, issued orders to Israel that they didn't like, but they had to obey. Uh, Obama broke the record. He didn't say anything, but... Uh, the... well, Obama did try to get a settlement freeze early on, and Netanyahu seemed to have played him. A limited settlement freeze, I recall. Settlement freeze was a joke, and Obama knew it. During the settlement freeze, as the Israeli press openly reported, all activities continued exactly before. What you called is some other name. Um, you know, some other euphemism was used for settlement. Obama knew it perfectly well. He could read the Israeli press. It wasn't secret. So there was nothing. He imposed nothing. Israel continued with its settlement policies. Uh, the uh, uh, He was the most pro-Israel president up to that point. Of course, Trump just uh, broke all the rules. But uh, uh, if American, if the United States puts its foot down, Israel must obey. They decided to be dependent on the United States to protect them against the world. Well, it's uh, things are shifting in many ways, but that part still is significant. And it means that if American policy changed, there could be changes in um, what Israel will be willing to do, including maybe moving towards a political settlement, maybe roughly along the lines of uh, the Geneva Accords in 2003. These were not formal, but high level uh, representatives of Israel and uh, the Palestinians uh, met and agreed on a fairly detailed program Israel totally rejected it, of course. The United States didn't even discuss it, just dismissed it. But if something like that could be revived, could mm -hmm. it work? I don't know. I want to ask you about domestic policy and propaganda and fascism here in the United States. Do you think, sir, that we have surpassed the world of George Orwell's 1984 in terms of surveillance and brainwashing and propaganda? Well, just take what I just discussed. The fact that we cannot even talk about the simple, obvious way to end what is regarded as one of the major threats to world peace. Can't talk about it. The closest, I mean, I've been shouting mine to the rooftops about this for years. So that's a difference between 1984. I'm not put into jail. I can keep uh, shouting into the wilderness. I can talk to you about it. I'm not arrested. No, no troops are coming in to drag me off. This is not like 1984. There's no... Uh, you're allowed to talk as long as nobody hears you. But uh, to try to get into the mainstream, no. In fact, the most sophisticated forms of propaganda, which actually Orwell talked a little about, interesting essay that was suppressed 
but he did talk about uh, thought control in free societies in a suppressed essay. But uh, this is the introduction uh, to Animal Farm, Animal the unpublished, Farm, yeah, which was unpublished, was found thirty years later. Uh, but uh, uh, he didn't say much about it. But what he said was to the point. And one of the things he said is that if you're well behaved, well indoctrinated, went to the best schools, you know that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say. It's in, in, inculcated into you. That's so things like what I just mentioned uh, in the uh, British uh, uh, period when British ruled the world for centuries. One of the things he wouldn't do to say is that Britain is a violent, brutal, vicious, murderous state. There were people who did say it, but they were just marginalized. Uh, the people in anywhere near the mainstream couldn't say that. That's one of the things it wouldn't do to say, had a good education. Well, we're similar. Uh, how is it done? It's actually done in very interesting ways. So let's take... Uh, Take, say, that debate that I mentioned on whether um, the um, intervention in Iraq was a humanitarian intervention. Notice, um, as I said, if it was in Moscow, we'd collapse in ridicule. Here we take it seriously. And somebody's allowed to say, no, it wasn't a humanitarian intervention. Notice that what's done is you instill the presupposition. The presupposition is it was maybe a mistake, uh, maybe not wonderful, but there was nothing basically wrong with it. That's the presupposition. That's good propaganda. You install presuppositions, you know, and then you allow free discussion within that framework. That's very effective. Many examples. Uh, a couple of couple of days ago, the New York Times had a lead article, maybe the Washington Post, I've forgotten, in which they said uh, there's now some skepticism about whether Russia carried out the sabotage of Nord Stream of the Nord Stream pipelines anywhere in the world outside the United States and some of its loyal allies. There's an obvious response to this. The least likely country to carry out the sabotage is Russia. These are Russian investments owned mainly by Gazprom, the Russian oil company. Why on earth should they destroy their own investments? Well, the claim in the West is uh, to stop gas supplies to Europe. They could have done that by turning a lever didn't have to blow up their major, uh, their major installations, huge investment. So they're the least likely country. Well, what country had the goal and the capability to sabotage the pipeline? Everywhere outside the United Loyal, the United States and its loyalists, the answer is obvious. The United States. In fact, the United States had said openly, publicly, they're not going to allow the pipelines to function. They've been opposed to them for years, certainly had the capability. In fact, the United States was carrying out major military naval maneuvers in the Baltic region uh, right at the time of the sabotage. Um, I mean, it's obvious. But what you do is, in a good propaganda system, you don't deny that the United States did it, because that would be quickly refuted. You turn to some other topic. You say, well, let's assume the Russians did it, and then we'll have a free and open debate about whether the there's some skepticism about what they did it. I mean, it's sometimes called the thief-thief technique. If you're caught with your hand in somebody's pocket, don't deny that there's a robbery, because they'll be refuted. Just point over there and say, thief, thief, they go after that guy. And that's subtle propaganda. Uh, we're subjected to it constantly on just about every issue. There are things it wouldn't do to say, 
wouldn't do to talk about, have a good education, it's inculcated into you. And then you carry out a lively free debate about whether the US uh, uh, invasion of Iraq was humanitarian intervention, which is totally insane, but, uh, uh, but you carry it out to show what an open free society we have while inculcating the propaganda line. And it's very effective. It seems to me there are two ways in which a free society or ostensibly free society limits debate. One is restrict debate before it begins and call that free speech. And the second is brainwash the population so they know which questions not to ask. So when Israel or these topics, foreign policy comes up in places like Harvard or Yale, there's a very limited conversation that happens. There isn't most questions, important questions aren't asked. Um, do you think that like the United States' concept of free speech and free inquiry, do you think that is something that is still held um, or is that withering away as well? Is that just a sham, the notion of constitutional protection of free speech here, or is that an illusion? Well, first of all, let's be clear. There's no constitutional protection of free speech. The First Amendment simply says the government can't prevent speech, can't intervene to stop speech. It doesn't say you can't punish speech. Perfectly possible for the government to punish speech under the First Amendment. In fact, it wasn't until the 20th century that these issues even began to reach the courts. And then you find through the 20th century, uh, expansion of the right to freedom of speech, at first in dissents, dissents by Holmes and Brandeis, uh, who nevertheless, and then gradually in the 19, by the 1960s, Supreme Court took a pretty strong stand on protecting freedom of speech. But to say that it's a constitutional right is uh, seriously misleading. Uh, in fact, there were plenty of harsh repression of freedom of speech throughout American history by the government, by others. Uh, it's a recent development and a good one. And we should support the, uh, the US is now probably in the lead in the world in having formal protections for freedom of speech. That doesn't change the nature of propaganda. It's entirely within the bounds of freedom of speech for Harvard to have a debate on whether the Iraq invasion was a humanitarian invasion or for the press to discuss whether there's some skepticism about Russian involvement in uh, the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines or whether, uh, uh, you know, uh, Iran is the greatest threat to anything else that we're talking about. Uh, you can have discussions within rigid limitations, uh, give the impression of lively debate, but meanwhile instill the doctrinal orthodoxy, basically by presupposition, the framework of debate. Uh, I don't even think this is consciously planned. It's just the obvious way to do things. Mm -hmm. you know, One thing isn't breaking new ground on this. One thing I'm noticing is the rise of right-wing thinkers to popularity and fame. Uh, they're building mass audiences, feeding them extremist ideas. What do you make of this? Is this a sign to come of what's in politics? Is this the same old story as well? The sort of rise of the right. And one person who comes to mind is Jordan Peterson, um, the Canadian psychologist. I, I bring him up only because he seems to have an army of young men now who are supporting him on social media. Is there something to his intellectual project or is that just yesterday's kind of authoritarian, authoritarianism dressed up into something new? Well, there's, I'd recommend a very good careful analysis of the Peterson phenomenon by Nathan Robinson, very astute young commentator in his journal, Current Affairs. But putting the individual, I just, tears it to shreds correctly, I think. Uh, but uh, the phenomenon is, as you say, an important one. Why 
do people like that have a, a ma mass audience? Why do people go to mega churches to listen to a pastor who tells them that the world was created a couple of thousand years ago? Uh, what kind of phenomenon is this? Well, that's an important question. Uh, we, why do half of Republicans think that the Democratic Party is run by pedophiles who are seeking to abuse children? Now, where do the, why does QAnon get uh, large scale support? Uh, these are all important questions. Uh, and I think if you look back at the origins, what you find is substantial breakdown of the social order. It's uh, connected, I think, with what uh, sociologist Robert Putnam in a famous book called Bowling Alone, he pointed out that uh, civic uh, interaction has simply declined. It's now changed from bowling along to texting along. You look at young people today, you go to, you see a bunch of kids sitting in uh, McDonald's and supposedly having a conversation and they're looking at their cell phones, uh, having a talk with somebody else. Uh, people are atomized, isolated. They feel they're, uh, for most of the population, it's a precarious existence. They're prey to some dark forces which are undermining them, trust in institutions has sharply declined, all institutions practically, uh, people are alone. Uh, the institutions that used to protect them, like labor unions, were destroyed. Labor unions weren't just about wages. Labor unions were communities, uh, cultural communities, communities of educational programs. People got together, were protected themselves from the depredations of powerful forces, all gone. It's actually Margaret Thatcher's dream. You recall her saying uh, with the opening of the neoliberal era, uh, she said, there's no society, uh, just individuals may have to take care of themselves in the marketplace. Of course, she was lying, lying totally and knew it. For the rich and powerful, there's plenty of a dense network of institutions, trade associations, chambers of commerce, uh, uh, the government that they largely control protects them. So for the rich in the corporate sector, dense, powerful society, but the rest of you are out there trying to survive somehow in the uh, uh, ravages of the market alone. And the first acts of Reagan and Thatcher correctly were to destroy labor unions, the ma major means of defense against this, to open the doors for corporate attacks on unions and so on. Clinton then joined in with his own version. Uh, well, when people are alone, hopeless, angry, resentful, they try to reach for something, maybe a mega church, uh, maybe Jordan Peterson, Let's hang on to something that at least gives us some kind of community. Well, that's, uh, I think that's probably at the source of what we're seeing. Notice it's not for the first time in American history. Uh, the uh, United States has been a, a off the spectrum in religious extremism since the uh, pilgrims arrived. Uh, literally, uh, great awakenings and so on. So it's by no means the first time, but um, I think it is related to major developments that have taken place during the neoliberal assault on the population in the past 40 years. What do you think of the term fascism? And do you foresee a situation where a serious and organized fascist movement could come to power in the United States? I think we have to make a distinction, a number of distinctions. One crucial one is between uh, two kinds of fascism. We might say straight, fa straight fascism, 
and doctrinal fascism, they're different things. Street fascism means uh, thugs, brown shirts, uh, beating people up, uh, uh, smashing up meetings, uh, you know, attacking uh, whoever the current target is, uh, Jews, Muslims, uh, LGBT people, that's street fascism. We see plenty of that. There's something quite different, doctrinal fascism, Hitler and Mussolini, they had doctrines. The doctrines were that a powerful state run by the dominant party and the maximal leader should control the whole society, including business. Business was subordinated to the Nazi and fascist parties. Is that the United States? The United States is the opposite. The state is subordinated to the private sector under the neoliberal era, which just became overwhelming. I mean, by now it's, it's almost a joke. So the first act of the Republican Congress House, first act is to cut funding from the inter Internal Revenue Service. Why? Because the IRS looks into tax cheating by the rich and the corporations. And since they are slaves of the corporate sector and the super rich, you have to pretend, prevent them from being in, investigated uh, for uh, tax cheating. I mean, it's become a comedy. It's the exact opposite of doctrinal fascism. They want the state to be what are even sometimes called libertarian, which is a bad joke. They want the state, the public, to be subordinated to unaccountable private power, concentrated private power, which is unaccountable. It's called liberty. Uh, it's quite the opposite of doctrinal fascism. Well, we ha we there's a good chance of street fascism taking over. I don't see much prospect for doctrinal fascism, more likely the opposite. What about this concept of friendly fascism or a leader in the future emerging who is more charismatic than Trump? Like, I think Trump's saving grace is that he's a clown. But imagine if he was cu cunning and had a theory of government and a theory of control and was actually had some intelligence to him. If another leader emerges who takes Trumpism and is more charismatic, couldn't that be a vehicle for fascism in the United States? Well, actually, no way for you to know it, but you're quoting what I've been saying for about 50 years. <laughs> I said for a long time that the United States is very lucky that we haven't had a charismatic figure who is honest, dedicated, committed to establishing fascist rule, a Hitler type. What we've had are clowns, Joe McCarthy, uh, um, Jim Backer, you know, the- Huey Long. Uh, running the evangelical churches, Trump, who's just a narcissistic megalomaniac, but we haven't had just what you described, a charismatic feature figure who's honest, committed to imposing both street and doctrinal fascism, a Hitler type, basically, not 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 a crazed megalomaniac with a uh, like a, an infant in a china shop like Trump. Well, we could get one. In fact, there's a likely one on the prospect right now. Governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, uh, um, dedicated, committed to not doctrinal fascism. He is subordinated, like all the Republicans, to private sector domination, but a, such a, a kind of friendly fascism controls. Don't teach American history. Uh, don't talk about uh, the women's rights and minority rights, none of this stuff, immigrant rights, none of that woke nonsense. Uh, let's just have a well-disciplined society that will be 
Christian nationalist and uh, subordinated to private power. And he's, uh, he looks like a person who's honest and thoughtful and could work to institute that. He, I think he's a very, if the Republican Party has any brains, they'll move to institute somebody like him, not like a clown like Trump. Mm -hmm. My last question for you, sir, has to do with the younger generation. They look up to you and read your work, and yet I sense a hopelessness among them sometimes between war, economic catastrophe, climate change, what we have been discussing. How do you think young people should respond to a political world that's rife with propaganda, extremism, and violence? What would you say to them? First of all, educate yourself about it so you understand it. Second, get together with others, organize to overcome it. Third, recognize that the younger generation today is facing a challenge that has never arisen in human history, never. Uh, we now face multiple crises. If you open the newspaper on January 24th, January 24th, you'll see the latest updating of the doomsday clock. You all know what the doomsday clock is. It's now set at 100 seconds to midnight. Under the Trump years, it went from minutes to seconds. Now this January 24th, it'll probably go closer. Midnight means termination. Goodbye. It was nice to know you. Uh, the, uh, a challenge like that has never arisen in human history. We are very close to the precipice on the threat of nuclear war, climate destruction, uh, the breakdown of democratic functioning and arena for public debate. So I suspect that on January 24th, the second hand will be moved closer to midnight. Well, that challenge is real. Uh, you can say what Greta Thunberg said correctly when she was at the Davos meeting, the meeting with the masters of the universe. She simply got up and said to them, you have betrayed us. You means my generation have betrayed her generation. That's true. That's absolutely true. We have given left as a legacy to young people today, an incredible challenge. They have the face the question, are we going to save the human species from suicide, along with the innumerable other species that we're destroying in our folly? Are we going to save them? Or are we going to fall over the precipice with them? It's a challenge, but it's also a prospect. Could be the most magnificent achievement in human history to save the species, other species from destruction. That's what you, there's no way to avoid this. You face it one way or another. You no way to go home and say, I don't want to bother with it. Can't, that's like saying, let's march over the precipice. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what younger people face today. Thank you very much, Professor Chomsky. Thank you for your life's work, for all of your contributions and writings, and happy belated 94th birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you.